San Diego's mayor and city attorney are at it again. Hi, I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, the latest battle between Bob Filner and Jan Goldsmith. Also tonight, Los Angeles police put out their report on the firing of an officer who went on a rampage for revenge last February. And I'm Peggy Pico. Also ahead, an update on California Public Records Act, where the bill stands now and why it matters in San Diego. Plus, there's no cap or limit on the amount that can be donated, said a DeMaio invitation. Why campaign experts say his advocacy group blurs campaign funding lines during his run for Congress. And art leaders get creative to get around hurdles for public art in La Jolla. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Erwin Jacobs and by... Well, good evening. Thanks for joining us. The turf war at City Hall continues as San Diego City Attorney Jan Goldsmith issues a statement tonight threatening some sort of action against Mayor Bob Filner. KPBS Metro reporter Sandia Dirks tells us what began this latest battle. On Tuesday, Mayor Filner had Deputy Attorney Andrew Jones removed from a closed session of the City Council. Our media partner, 10 News, got a transcript of that meeting. Reading it is a little bit like reading an intense scene from a play. Filner accuses Jones of essentially being a snitch and leaking information to the press. Filner asks Jones to leave. Jones refuses, then the mayor goes and gets security, and the officer gets Jones to leave. Now, the city attorney is speaking out, and he's got some pretty acerbic words for the mayor. He says it was a cruel act. He calls it an extreme abuse of power. And he says Filner has gone over the line of decent behavior. And he says stay tuned, because we are going to take action on this. Yeah, and we know this back and forth has been going on for a while. Do you know anything about what kind of action the city attorney's talking about? No, the city's attorney's office won't say. But it isn't the biggest step to think it could be some sort of legal action. I also want to add that the city attorney said in his memo that he and the mayor weren't feuding. But it's hard not to read this latest clash between the two top elected officials in San Diego as anything but a feud. On the mayor's side, we are hearing that he used uh, his line item veto to cut an additional $500,000 from the city attorney's office. Uh, that was money the mayor had cut before, and the city council voted to put it back in. Now, it's gone again. It seems both sides aren't backing down from this. I'll say it. Feud. <laughs> KPBS Metro reporter Sandia Dirks. And we've got Jan Goldsmith's full statement online. You can find it at kpbs.org. Sound and just the finding of a Los Angeles Police Department review on the firing of Christopher Dorner, the ex-cop who killed four people before dying in a gun battle with police near Big Bear just before last February's killing spree. Dorner published an online manifesto claiming he was railroaded and a victim of discrimination. The LAPD report says the firing was justified because of Dorner's, quote, documented proclivity to concoct allegations and evidence to advance his personal agenda, end quote. The report goes to the L.A. Police Commission next week. More encouraging news tonight on the jobs front. Another drop in unemployment for San Diego and the state. The local rate has been falling steadily since late last year. For May, it was down to 6.7 percent. The biggest job gains were in the leisure and hospitality industry here. And statewide, unemployment is down to its lowest level in nearly five years at 8.6 percent. It's the first time the rates dipped below 9 percent since November 2008. But... California's unemployment rate is still one percentage point higher than the national average. On Monday, the Senate will take a test vote on its immigration reform bill. It's set up a 13-year pathway to citizenship for millions who are in the country illegally. And it calls for a military-style surge to increase security along the border with Mexico. About a dozen Republicans say they'll support the bill. And Senate Democrats say that support could sway Republicans in the House. Election law experts say former San Diego mayoral candidate Carl DeMaio is blurring the line of campaign limits with his tax-exempt political advocacy group. Peggy Pico explains why. 
Shortly after losing San Diego's mayoral election, Republican candidate Carl DeMaio jumped right back into fundraising. But his longtime tax-exempt political advocacy group, Reform San Diego, is a questionable way to raise unlimited campaign funds during his current run for Congress. Joining me with details on the matter is KPBS reporter Claire Tragesser. Claire, welcome back. Thank you. Now, you were reporting on Reform San Diego. You were looking into that when Carl DeMaio announced his uh, bid for Congress. How did that change things? Right. So his congressional run, in some ways, calls into question the money that he raised under Reform San Diego. Reform San Diego is a political advocacy group, and so it can really raise unlimited contributions. There's no limit to the amount that people can donate. But when you're running for Congress, the amounts that you receive from people in, in political donations are limited. So basically, Reform San Diego is a tax exempt, as you said, this political advocacy group. Mm -hmm. Why would DeMaio's involvement in it uh, blur the lines in fundraising? as some experts have said. Right. Well, because um, Reform San Diego is technically classified as a 527 group, and it means it's a tax-exempt organization that raises money for political activities. Now, laws are fuzzy about whether these groups can specifically advocate for a candidate saying, you should really vote for this person or you really shouldn't vote for that person. The question is, could DeMaio use the money that he raised with Reform San Diego to support his congressional campaign? And DeMaio told us that, no, he's not, he's not going to use that so money. So he's voluntarily saying he's not going to do it. But uh, tell us a little bit about how it's, it's, some of that money could be hidden or some of that could not be disclosed. Well, it, he, Reform San Diego will have to disclose its donors. Um, the point is that because... Uh, DeMaio is still the chair of Reform San Diego. That's that's very unusual for someone who is running for a federal office to also chair a group like this. And that's because the group can help get him out in front of voters, raise his profile, and um, just keep him on the front of people's minds. So even if they aren't financially supporting him, they're still helping him indirectly. Right. Is there any uh, legal ramifications as far as you said the laws are fuzzy, but uh, because this is so rare, would somebody kind of go after that if he does start gaining momentum and, and maybe possibly even votes or support for uh, his run? Well, one of the things that we found when we talked to election experts is they say that the Federal Elections Commission, the FEC, very rarely um, makes any kind of decision saying, no, no, you shouldn't have done this because the group itself is so polarized and they need to vote um, with a majority to say that this person has done the wrong thing. So even though maybe it's walking a fuzzy line, it's very unlikely that, that anyone's going to find that he's broken call, any laws. Right, call yeah. him out on it, essentially. Now, since he announced his congressional run, uh, Reform San Diego has changed a little bit. Tell me some of the changes that have happened there. That's right. So kind of subtly and slowly leading up to the time when DeMaio announced he was running for Congress, Reform San Diego, um, a, a paper was filed with the city changing its name from Reform San Diego with Carl DeMaio to just Reform San Diego. And his name was removed from the website as one of the leaders. So in some ways, it looked like he was kind of distancing himself from the group. But that at the same time, the website also added contribution limits to the donations that it was collecting, which kind of suggests that maybe he was going to use that money for his campaign. But we asked him about it, and what he said was, no, he's not going to use that money. He did it because there was a, some FEC advisory from 2003 saying, if you are a candidate or a, a congressman and running a group like this, you need to have dona donation limits on the group as well. But it's certainly a gray sort of foggy area that you're, uh, he's able to maneuver in uh, during this campaign run. Now, back in January uh, at the Reform San Diego fundraiser, you went to it and you heard some interesting uh, comments and the invitation certainly had something interesting on it. Tell us about that. Yeah, so Reform San Diego has been around since 2004, but this was, they called it the relaunch of Reform San Diego. Carl DeMaio had just lost the mayor's race to Bob Filner. People were very down. His supporters were down about, um, you know, the status of the city. And so he brought everyone together, kind of rallied the troops. And Lori Zapf, who is a San Diego City Councilwoman, introduced him as the future something. And she said, because Carl DeMaio is never going away. Um, so it's interesting that even at that time, it seemed like likely that he was going to run for something else. It was a little uh, foreshadowing of yeah. what was happening. Noah, I want to let folks know they can see uh, all of your stories about this and other stories that you've done on kpbs.org. Claire Tragerser, thanks so much for this update. Thank you.
A door of hope is now open for homeless families in Linda Vista. It's also the name of the Salvation Army's new campus for mothers and children with 24 apartments. Yolanda Kersey is moving in with her daughter and granddaughter. They've been in the Salvation Army's emergency shelter since October after living out of their car. I don't know, I'm just excited. She'll have her own room. Like right now we share a room, but she'll have her own room over there. We have an oven. It'll just be more like a home. So I've been looking forward to like, I'll be here for Thanksgiving. I could cook Thanksgiving meal. And so I'm just excited. Families can stay at the facility for up to two years while they get work. Door of Hope also offers counseling, education, and other services. 56 families are on the waiting list. People around the world mark World Refugee Day tomorrow, paying tribute to the estimated 45 million people displaced from their homes due to war and violence. KPBS reporter Susan Murphy tells us many of those refugees continue to pour into San Diego every year. San Diego provides a welcome mat to an average of 3,500 refugees every year. The region is one of the top destinations for refugees in the United States. Since 1975, San Diego has resettled a very diverse population of 100,000 refugees, including Somalis, Congolese, Ethiopians, Iraqis, Cambodians, and Bhutanese. Bob Montgomery is executive director for the San Diego Office of the International Rescue Committee. He says the average stay in a refugee camp is 17 years, and refugees have often suffered greatly before arriving to San Diego. We do see people that are uh, have chronic illnesses that we need to address. Uh, people come with very little, uh, you know, certainly in the way of clothes uh, uh, or belongings of any kind, certainly uh, very little if no money at all. Montgomery says in addition to entering into a new culture with a new language and no belongings, refugees face many other challenges, finding work, getting their children integrated into school, and getting medical care. People who have lived in refugee camps or a refugee type situation for a long period of time haven't had access to uh, comprehensive uh, medical care and consequently um, they may have conditions that have to be addressed before they're employable. Uh, and, or can make a successful resettlement. The Syrian civil war has contributed to the high number of world refugees. Montgomery said San Diego is receiving Iraqi refugees from Syria, but there's not a program yet for Syrian refugees to come to the United States. If the violence continues, the impacts continue, and the suffering of the refugees continues, I think the United States will, will have to take a closer look at, of, of including Syrian refugees in, into the flow to the United States and assisting them to rebuild their lives. San Diegans will pay tribute to refugees who have resettled here on Saturday from 11 to 4 at the Market Creek Plaza. Susan Murphy, KPBS News. State lawmakers backed away from changing California's public access laws this week, but as Peggy Pico explains, some warn it's not enough and want a constitutional amendment. The proposed changes to the California Public Records Act, or CPRA, were originally embedded in the state's new budget as a way to cut cost. California reimburses local governments for their cost of providing public access to those records. But after outrage from the public and media over proposed changes that would have meant cities, counties, and school districts could opt out of providing public records with no explanation, Sacramento lawmakers revised the bill, restoring the PRA to its original state. Here to talk more about the cost of democracy and the public's right to know is Voice of San Diego's Scott Lewis. Welcome back. Thank you, Peggy. Hey. Scott, remind us of when the CPRA passed and, and why it was passed in the first place. Well, I believe it was uh, Ronald Reagan in 1972. Um, it's just a it's it's a basic accountability and transparency me measure. You know, if you if the public's business is public, we should be able to uh, request virtually all documents. There's a lot of exceptions uh, for uh, personnel issues, for negotiations or litigation issues, uh, but um, by and large, you should be able to see what government's doing. And and uh, this was a requirement that all local governments, not just the state, um, do that. Provide what, were, what were the proposed changes? If you could kind of highlight those for us. Well, so for example, when you um, when you ask for a public document, so you request it, they have 10 days to let you know uh, that they got that request. Uh, and then they have some time to uh, let you know if they're going to comply and then comply. 
And then they can, uh, and they can explain why not. They're supposed to explain why they reject it, what law, what they're referring to, how the uh, documents correspond to some exception. And, uh, and then you can challenge that. The problem with California's law is that ultimately there's no teeth. So in, even as it exists, uh, to actually get something done, if you in, are in a, uh, a loggerheads with an agency, you have to sue them eventually. Um, but it's still a requirement. It's a law that they're supposed to provide that. So investigative journalists, citizens, uh, academics, all kinds. Businesses. Yeah, use these mm -hmm. things. Uh, political candidates use these requests to get information, do investigations, and hold their government accountable. See if there's things that can be done more efficiently or just tell stories. And as journalists, and you in particular over Voice of San Diego, you use this quite a bit to get yeah. data. In particular, there was a, a story here in San Diego uh, County that uh, was dismissed uh, because of public notice. Do you, do you recall that story with Walter uh, Eckerd? Uh, there's there's all kinds of issues. I'm sorry, I'm not mm -hmm. familiar with that exact one you're referring to, but there's all kinds of issues that come up all the time where they reject uh, a public records request, and it's it's uh, often sometimes they don't re just reject it. They say it's well, we'll give you those re records, but it's seventy five thousand dollars or something. You know, like so you you end it's up prohibited. Uh, yeah, obviously. Right. So you have to fight these things. And look, uh, we're fine with the fight as it is. It, California's is one of the weakest public records laws. I mean, something like Florida is much much stronger, but. Uh, uh, but you know, uh, we're weak because there's no least, there's no consequences if they don't comply. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. And so um, this provision would have allowed uh, local governments to to opt out and to and to not tell you why they were going to reject something. But uh, more importantly, so we could have trusted like the city council of the city and others to comply because they we would have shamed them into it. It's the little districts that we were worried about: the Sweetwater School districts, the water districts, all these public agencies that uh, don't get enough attention that might have uh, taken the governor's option and said, hey, we're not going to comply this year. Let's talk about the new assembly member, Lorena Go Gonzalez. And uh, Voice of San Diego revealed a, a Twitter conversation between her and local journalists, including you. What did she say? Well, she was, uh, she was uh, in a weird position because we're saying, why are you going to support this thing? And she... Uh, support the changes. Yeah, this, mm -hmm. this change is one of her first votes in, as an assemblywoman. And it's like, why are you, why are you going to put this on your record? This is a pretty n negative stain. And she said, well, it, it was paired with a worker's protection bill, worker, worker protections that were in a trailer bill for the uh, whole budget. She's like, look, I can't vote against that. And so uh, I guess I have to support so this, too. So it sort of too. just came along. So she was in a tough spot, but that's, uh, you know, at the same time that they passed this bill, they also raised their own salaries. So here they are cutting, they, you know, we have to make cuts, so we're going we're gonna to gut the public's access law, reduce public access to information, but we're also going to give ourselves a higher pay. So this, uh, the framing of this just became disastrous for Democrats, and uh, that's what provoked the, uh, uh, the, the changes. Ultimately, uh, the head of the Senate in, the, in California was, was resistant to changes, but he decided to change his yeah, and then they were amended. So what's next? Well, uh, what's next is not only did they uh, reverse their decisions, but now there's pledges to actually embed this into the Constitution. So it's not just a law, but actually part of our Constitution in California, which would help the state also avoid some of these problems with uh, reimbursement. Uh, we'll see if it does. It's also an opportunity to make it a stronger law, too. Yeah, absolutely. So Scott Lewis with Voice of San Diego, thanks so much for the update. Thanks, Peggy. The government may soon ease rules about turning off your cell phone and other electronics on the airplane. Right now, of course, you have to turn everything off uh, during takeoff and landing. But the Federal Aviation Administration is considering a change. You still couldn't make phone calls, but you could read an e-book or, say, play Angry Birds. An FAA panel is working on the plan. If changes do happen, it won't be in time for your summer vacation. And if your daily routine includes a trip to Starbucks, get ready to dig a little deeper for your caffeine fix. Starbucks says it will raise prices on many of its drinks starting Tuesday, an average of about 1%, despite a drop in the costs for coffee. The company says it's the first time prices uh, have increased in about two years. And not everything, though, is going up. If you want a grande mocha frappuccino or a venti drip coffee, Starbucks says those prices will remain the same. More than 25% of San Diego County fourth graders cannot read proficiently, and studies show reading skills are lost over the summer, especially among children who don't have access to books at home. That's why two San Diego organizations are joining forces to make a difference. It's a day of action for about 100 United Way volunteers helping San Diego families who can't afford to buy summer reading books for their kids. This is a very small step towards 
empowering our children to engage in reading so that they have dramatically different futures. John Vance is with the United Way in San Diego, and every summer they do something to support the community. This year it's bilingual books, bags, and personalized notes to inspire a love for reading. A lot of our community is bilingual, and so we, we, need, to, we need to focus on that and address it and develop programs around it. So that's why it's 25,000 books we raised over a, a, very, a very short virtual book drive in March. More than half of San Diego's students come from low-income families, and Jim Floros with the Food Bank says this is another way to break the cycle of poverty. So not only helping feed kids, but also giving them books so they can continue to learn and read is what we really need to help people go forward and have a successful, uh, a bountiful life. About 4,000 books will be distributed to kids throughout the county this summer. And organizers say children who own their books are more likely to read them, and good readers are more likely to graduate from high school. I'm Ray Suarez. On the next news hour, Shields and Brooks analyze the week's news and take your questions live online. That's Friday on the PBS NewsHour. When it comes to public art, there's always controversy in San Diego. Both the port and the city place art in the community, but politics and bureaucracy have sometimes thwarted those efforts. The port just had their public art budget cut in half. KPBS culture reporter Angela Caron says a group in La Jolla is using a different approach to public art, and it seems to be working. If you've driven down La Jolla Boulevard recently, you might have noticed a bright yellow billboard of people walking. If this is an advertisement, it's not clear what it's for. On the reverse side, a vibrant pink sign. And again, faceless pedestrians stride through the frame. It might be an advertisement. It might be a painting. We don't know exactly what. Um, but it's not there as a saying, hi, I'm a big piece of art. But it is, in fact, a big piece of art. It's one of 11 murals that have been placed in La Jolla over the last couple of years. Michael Critchman is on the Committee of Arts Leaders that helped put them there. All of us on that committee, most all of us, have been through, in one way or another, the public art wars in, in San Diego and uh, um, pretty consistent losing those wars. So I think that it was not something that we were interested in in, uh, in making an unpleasant process. San Diego's public art wars have led to controversial decisions. A Nancy Rubin's boat sculpture was supposed to grace Harbor Drive. It was voted down. The statue of a sailor kissing a nurse was voted in, despite opposition from a committee of experts. In order to get the La Jolla murals up, the group made a decision. They decided to take their public art project and go private. Obviously, with the, with the city, you're dealing with public dollars, public funding, and it's a, a, a slightly different process. It's private funding, private property, so it's, a, it's very different in nature. Linda Forche is the curator of the mural project. She says they decided early on to put the murals on private property. It was a process of really walking around, just kind of looking for blank facades, and it turns out that there were many. They found buildings they liked, contacted the property owners, and asked if they'd be willing to have a temporary mural on their building. Many agreed, including Leon Cassell, who likes the mural on his building so much, he doesn't want it to go away. Well, I hope it stays here forever, as long as I own the building. Once I don't own it, but I hope it still stays here. The mural is by artist Roy McMakin. It's composed of painted squares, all different colors. I asked Cassell, what if they wanted to put a provocative mural on the side of his building? So what? Let them do it. I mean, as long as, long as it's, it's decent, but so what? You know, it will be a, a topic for conversation. And again, as I said, that will bring people to La Jolla. Not to buy a t-shirt, just walk around and look at the art. The murals aren't only on private property, they are funded with private dollars. Budgets range between $20,000 and $75,000. The murals are also temporary. They will each be rotated out eventually. You know, so I think that's been a, probably one of the reasons that, um, you know, the people have liked the project, and if they don't like a particular mural, they know that um, it will be changed, that something else will be coming along. 
The murals are made inexpensively using billboard technology. The artist sends a digital file of the image. It's printed on vinyl and secured to the wall on a metal frame. This mural by Ryan McGinnis is so large it's printed on three pieces of vinyl. If you have dinner at George's at the Cove, make sure to reserve the table where you can see the mural by John Baldessari. The newest addition is this mural by Los Angeles artist Gajin Fujita. He is um, first generation Japanese, but he grew up in East LA. So I think you'll see that his, his work is really a hybrid of those two traditions and sensibilities coming together in a really dynamic and interesting way. The Murals of La Jolla project was spearheaded by the La Jolla Community Foundation. The goal is to have 16 murals in place. After that, the group will begin rotating new murals in. Unlike public art pieces that will be with us for decades to come, the temporary nature of the murals means a variety of art on otherwise bland walls. Angela Carone, KPBS News. Tony Hawk is donating his first skateboard to the Smithsonian. The San Diego native is one of the world's best-known professional skateboarders, and while he's retired from the sport, he's now an entrepreneur and philanthropist. And it all started with a hand-me-down fiberglass board when he was nine. The donation is part of a celebration of skateboarding this weekend at the National Museum of American History. You can find tonight's stories and download the KPBS app all on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us. Have a great weekend.